Hey guys, this is Brad with Main Stage Music taking you on another vintage guitar voyage, which of course is just a cool online piece of content that I try to share with you guys. A lot of rare, weird, I shouldn't even say rare, but just weird old stuff, vintage stuff that you may never have seen before, and I'll just give you the quick rundown on it. What am I talking about today? I'm talking about the 1959 EH500 Skylark. Go through full screen on this one, because let me tell you something. Um, front screen, maybe? Whatever word you want to use. There we go. This right here is a real Gibson instrument that I don't want to guess on what um, they use to model this, right? But it sure does look like something that would have been drawn on the inside of a stall door. Maybe they didn't do that kind of stuff back in the 50s, but maybe they did, and this is the ultimate uh, prank product that was made by Gibson. All right, now this uh, EH500 Skylark is what we call affectionately a lap steel. Ha ha. Okay, I know it's getting worse. So you, you use this thing and you put it on your lap and you play with it. Um, oh, I know, this is getting worse and worse. But anyways, this actually was a very popular um, instrument. Still is today. The steel, um, of course, is played face up like this. And it is a, effectively an electric dobro, okay? Uh, and of course, I know I'm using the term dobro wrong, resonator. But basically, you play it using a slide or tone bar. And so I'm using the tone bar here and you use your hands here to pick it, and then you just rest the, the uh, tone bar down on the strings. And you just play up. So with all the popularity of country music, everyone has heard this, although the lap steel originally wasn't designed for country and western music. No, it was for Hawaiian music because that slack key Hawaiian style um, was all the rage back in the 1920s through, well, I don't know. I guess if you watch SpongeBob, it's still popular today. But um, that slack key sound is, um, is gotten with a, uh, a resonator style guitar and then later the electric version was the lap steel which um, some people would argue the very first electric guitars ever okay um, was the Rickenbacker frying pan which was a lap steel okay so Gibson got right in there because they're a um, manufacturer of, uh, of steel of, of all kind of guitars and stringed instruments this one was made from 1957 through 1967. Um, basically, it is a fairly Spartan built instrument, okay? It is made uh, just from a single slab of wood, okay? The wood, though, is pretty cool. It is called African Black Limba Wood, or Gibson used the word Corina, which is still used today. So this is made from Carina wood. Now, you know what else was made from Carina wood around the same time frame? The forward-thinking Gibson Futuristic series guitars, which you now know as the Flying V, or the Explorer, or the Futura, okay? Those were made from African Limba wood, or Carina. Um, it's very similar to mahogany as far as its style, but it's very bright. It has a nice um, bright tone and appearance. It's, it's very light colored. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's, a, it's actually very well made as most all Gibson stuff is, but it's very simply laid out. You can look here at the detail work. 
The um, nut is just a piece of, uh, we'll call it cylinder or whatever. It's just a solid piece of, uh, let's try a different, go ahead, try that uh, angle again. There you go. You can just see that it is a, a basic pipe, okay, just a little uh, that the strings lay on top of, all right. And that same um, thing is down here underneath this um, tail piece or whatever, this cover, is a identical to the nut. Um, this is just so you have something to lay your hand on. This pickup is a single coil pickup, not one of their um, new fandangled humbucking pickups. Um, and this style of pickup is unique to this guitar. Now some people will argue that, no, 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 that's the same pickup that they used in the Melody Maker guitars. Well, I'll tell you, it is probably the same coil that they used, but physically it's a little bit larger than those, and so they're not interchangeable. Um, the knobs are what's called bonnet knobs, which would have been correct for um, the late 50s. If they were on a Les Paul, they would be gold colored, but these are black. And they even has the little pointers, which is kind of a cool little uh, touch. Simple uh, chromed or nickel plated um, plate, and if you take that off, it's just a pool route underneath there. Um, and the jack is mounted right to the top. So really, as far as production, these things were probably super easy for Gibson to manufacture, okay? Um, now, you look at uh, this fretboard, it's just a uh, plastic, like a phenolic style plastic, and they just use small uh, nails and probably some adhesive to glue it on there. So um, this looks like the kind of project that any aspiring woodworker could make himself, honestly. It's very, very simple. Um, the tuning machines are the three on a strip style, okay? Let's do a close up on that. Um, so these would be the same uh, tuners that Gibson would have used on their budget guitars, like the Les Paul Jr., the uh, Gibson J45 or LG series models. So it was a very common Cluson key with the plastic buttons. The uh, serial number on this one is the classic inked on style, which here's a neat little thing. If you guys want to know with solid body Gibsons, uh, how do you read the serial number on them? Well, you see it's basically, um, go to this camera, it's basically, um, yeah, there we go. It's basically one digit, a space, and then four digits, right? So the first digit is the year in the 1950s. So in this case, it's nine. Then a space, then four digits, 1580 on this one. So um, now you might think, well, what's with the space? Well, the space is in case they made more than, you know, um, 10,000 of them, I guess in that particular year. Um, maybe, I don't know. So, because um, uh, 1960, they just was a zero, all right? But, uh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's your basic thing. Now the, um, the decal on this is a molded, uh, you know, we'll call it a molded uh, plastic. In other words, it was in a mold, you know, not molded like, you know, modern day cases and stuff are. Um, kind of a thin plastic, but this uh, badge right here would have been the same style of badge that not only the futuristic guitars like the Flying V, Explorer, and so on used, but also their amplifiers would have used. So if you look at Gibson uh, amplifiers from the 1950s, they, their amp badges, which were actually on the uh, grill cloth in the top left corner, um, would have looked like this. Now oftentimes these guitars were sold to aspiring musicians, okay? Um, so they were sold as a kit. So you'd get a um, Skylark guitar and then you could get a Skylark amplifier as well. And so I'm sure a lot of these, if you find them, are going to come with a little amp as well. Um, the amp, kind of a cute thing, was a um, kind of a cream colored. It matched the case and the case on this thing is really cool. Um, in classic Gibson style, you know, it's well made. It's made by um, Lifton, and the case on this has a little Gibson badge on it right there, and you open it up, and it is very nice. I mean, look at that. I mean, for something, you know, this is, you know, this wasn't their cheapest model, but they made a lot of these, okay? There's estimates that there's well over 
a thousand or more. I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of records that have been lost and so on. But I know that this is another guitar that if you want to say, you know, I have a Karina Gibson from 1959, and then all your friends are like, oh my God, thinking you're talking about some half million dollar Explorer Flying V, you can show them one of these and be like, yeah, I'll see. So, and technically, and look at me, I've got a Karina 1959 Karina. Um, these you can usually get for less than 1500 bucks, oftentimes under a grand. Um, and, uh, Honestly, back in the day, that's about what they sold for, which is kind of funny to think of a grand now as being beginner money. But um, honestly, for a musical instrument like Gibson, you, they wouldn't sell this for a grand. You know, you'd, this thing right here, they'd probably sell for $2,500 if it was in today's money. So, um, you know, this is a very cool thing. Okay, so as far as playing it, um, here's what's so, you know, this instrument was effectively rendered obsolete um, because of two guys, all right? And those two guys were Shot Jackson and Buddy Emmons. And I know you don't know who those guys are unless you're a steel player, but those are the two guys who invented the show Bud, which means Shot and Bud, Buddy Emmons. Okay, so um, those two guys created a steel that you didn't have to keep changing the tuning if you wanted to, you know, play a different song, you could just push a pedal and it would change. These guitars, you got one tuning, that's it. Just so, just like a dobro, which means if um, you wanted to have kind of like a, you know, E7 or C9 or all these different tunings that you can do for different songs, like you're cheating hard or walking after midnight or any number of different things, you got one tuning and that's it. So they would take. Um, and make what they called consoles, which were multiple necks of these lap steels in a big, it was like a size of a desk. So you'd have these steels, you know, two, three, four of them oftentimes, where you'd have, oh, here's one tuning, and then here's another tuning, and then here's another tuning. So this guy right here being a single neck lap steel wouldn't have been, you know, the high dollar professional version. And also, um, it wouldn't have been something that a professional could have taken out on a gig because he's going to need different tunings. This, so this would have been just for fun. So these were effectively made obsolete when the, la the pedal steel came out. So if you ever go to a country music show and you see that guy sitting there playing steel, all the pedals, that was thanks to Shot Jackson and Buddy Emmons, and that instrument effectively uh, made these obsolete for a long time. But then you had other people that started realizing that, dude, you know, I, I'm not a country music player. I'm playing bluesy stuff, you know, and I could put a little overdrive on this and I can do some neat things. You're right. And you had these, uh, I guess you call it folk alternative or outlaw country or whatever. People that are now doing really cool things with lap steels. And, um, And so with this, man, they're a lot of fun. You get a little overdrive pedal, some reverb, a little tube amp, and you can get some really cool things out of a lap steel. So um, these are collectible again. Also, if you're you know, just a nerd like me, they're kind of fun to decorate your house with, you know, because you can get a lot of these vintage Gibson-y things for less than 500 bucks, or you know, to put it in like wife speak, less than what, I don't know, going and buying fake art from like a home decorative store would cost. And this is real Americana. So, you know, uh, lap steels are fun, blah, blah, blah. This particular one though is uh, not Gibson's most expensive, but you know, definitely a cool little tie-in to their futuristic, you know, guitars, the Flying V, the Explorer and so on. So the EH500 Skylark, Karina Skylark. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the, the quick rundown and, um, you know, make sure that you, you like our channel and do all that kind of junk and, and stay tuned for always more cool content from, uh, main stage music.